This is Byron Gordon for the SES Conference Channel, and we are at SES San Jose 2009, where we have uh, just finished hearing from Clay Shirky, our keynote speaker this morning, author of Here Comes Everybody. Clay, uh, you talked about changing user behaviors as a result uh, of the tools that the internet has bestowed upon yep. us, if you will. Yep. And uh, you had a, an example that I thought maybe you could um, share with us a little bit uh, about HSBC recently and how they offered a penalty-free checking account and what on suit afterwards. Well, they offered the penalty-free checking account to college students uh, for the obvious reason. Students could, could uh, run up an overdraft and not suffer, and so they got thousands of customers. And then when the students were spread around during the summer, they were spread out during the summer, they reneged on the deal. And so HSBC assumed that they could change this policy and have the students not react because the students were just hopelessly dispersed. So a guy named Wes Streeting puts up a page on Facebook, which HSBC had not been counting on, and the Facebook site became the source of such a large and prolonged protest among thousands and thousands of people that within a few weeks HSBC had to back down again. So that was one of the early examples of a managed organization like a bank running into the fact that its users are not just, or its customers are not just atomized and disconnected people. They can actually come together and act as a group now because we've got these platforms that allow us to coordinate with one another. Let's talk about another example. You mentioned now how um, uh, tools, these tools can be used uh, to motivate. And uh, you mentioned the example of the uh, Josh Groban and the Grobenites for Charity. Okay. Highlight that one again for us. So Grobenites for Charity is a group of Josh Groban fans who call themselves Grobenites who got together and decided to raise money for charity and give it in honor of, of Josh Groban's birthday, Josh Groban the singer. It went so well that they did it a couple of times, then they tried it online and all of a sudden it went really well. In this year, on track to have raised cumulatively a million dollars. So this is a group of amateurs, really, people who come together and are doing this for the love of the thing, who have nevertheless achieved what we would think of as professional scale and professional reach. But interestingly, they've done it without becoming, without taking on the trappings of professional organizations. They've kept themselves uh, small and social, and they've actually partnered with the Josh Groban Foundation, which is the professional half, but rather than becoming one single entity, they've said, we wanted to keep our amateur status, but operate on this global stage. And, and they're using these tools to essentially be able to bridge that gap, to stay true to kind of amateur motivations, while at the same time having these really big goals, like raising a million dollars. So let me ask you this. Uh, you said the price or cost of sharing has dropped. It's, it's so low that basically, you know, anybody can put up a web page today, anybody can put up a blog, and frequently, it's, does. And frequently do, and does. And it's forced uh, traditional media sites, that's even like the New York Times, to consider publishing material that they wouldn't have considered in the past to publish. Is this in a way contributing to what some of us might call infotainment and does it hurt news gathering and collection because so much of this information well, Lord, yeah, is yeah, being yeah. featured now? Yeah, I, I don't think the infotainment problem seems to me to have actually started in the 1980s uh, with the rise of cable television. Um, the, often, and, and, and surprisingly, what users are asking for from newspapers isn't more package, more glitzy, more entertaining stuff. They're asking for raw data. So very often they want access to source material. Uh, the second question is really the $64 million question. What does this do to news gathering? Uh, that question is unfortunately totally bound up not just in the desire of the public to know things about the news landscape, but also in the advertising market. And so we don't have a clean test of what would happen if we had an internet that enabled group action but wasn't completely destroying the classified advertising market for newspapers. So the great risk that we've got right now is that there'll be this huge dip in the quality of journalism as newspapers start to downsize. Whether they, whether they go out of business or simply become smaller, they'll be you know, significantly smaller than they were at their peak in, in the middle of this decade. And how quickly can we experiment with crowdsource models to pick up the slack? And that seems to me to be the really big important question, right? The, the suffering of newspapers is baked into the advertising market, and that's suffering, you know, a, a historic once in 50 year shift right now. Uh, but 
how can we take advantage of what users are able to do to improve journalism even as newspapers are shrinking? And I don't know that we can do it fast enough to avoid this dip, but that seems to be at least the challenge we face. Do you think more people are going to continue to pursue more the opinions they want to read about and less the actual facts? Oh, this is the, this is the echo chamber thing. Again, this started not with the internet but with cable news. I mean, certainly the, the, the nicheification of cable news uh, brought about the sort of this, this, this concern about the echo chamber. One of the things that's surprising about the web is the ability to fact check so that when you get partisan stuff like the faked George Bush memo, you actually, a, a faked memo purporting to show that Bush had gotten out of National Guard service through, through mm -hmm. some shenanigans or gotten into National Guard service during the Vietnam War, that memo was a fake, but the people who unveiled the fake weren't the mainstream media, they were the bloggers. And so for people who are however partisan they are, are genuinely committed to facts, there does seem to be a kind of um, ability to be self-correcting. The big risk is really people who, are, who, who just decide they don't care what the facts are at all. Those people have always existed, but now, like everybody else, it's easier for them to coordinate. And I think one of the big challenges in, in the political realm is going to be, as with the birthers now, the people denying the legitimacy mm -hmm. of Obama's, uh, Obama's citizenship, that they may simply decide not to accept anything, any evidence contrary to their thesis. And the, the great question is, are we dealing with a 90% of the public cares to some degree about facts and there's two 5% fringes, or are we really dealing with only 30% of the public that's going to stay fact-based and we just get two enormous fringes? And again, we don't we don't know yet. I'm I'm betting on something closer to the 90% scenario, but it, it's I, I also admit it's an open question. A, a subject for your next book, maybe? Maybe. Who knows? I mean, well, the next the next book actually is it's about the stuff I was talking about here. Stopping paying attention to behavior and instead paying attention to user motivations as they're filtered through available tools, so that we can stop being surprised by new behaviors and instead say, when when new capabilities come along. What are users motivated to do with these tools? Because that seems to me to be a better way to think about the future than, oh my gosh, people are sharing and they never used to share before. Well, nobody ever really gave us the chance before. So that's the subject of the next book. Thanks so much for talking to us, Clay. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. And there is more to come here at SES San Jose 2009. Stay tuned.